Okay. So uh, we just watched the video. Um, interesting, these two units you probably don't see all too often. Uh, a lot of the units look like the one we have here in the lab, the GE uh, AMX4 Plus, or maybe there's even a new one, Plus Plus. I don't know. But um, I do kind of like these because you can see past them, right? The, the bar isn't as high. Well, they're still... Still could be better. Um, these are kind of nice. I don't know if you noticed in the video that when they are angling, they actually have a, a degree of angle readout on their tubes, whereas the GE doesn't. You just kind of have to guess. I mean, it, it'll kind of stop at 90, but if you wanted like 48, you'd have to, you know, guess for the most part. Um, so... What is the rationale for uh, doing a portable? Uh, essentially, the rationale is for patients that are too ill um, or are compromised in some way that they can't come down to the department, we can go to them. Unfortunately, this gets abused quite often. You may have seen this already um, because they can't find a wheelchair or they can't find a stretcher. Why not just have the tech come up and do the x-ray? But what they don't realize is they're missing a lot of information uh, because usually let's take a chest, for example, because we do lots of chest portables. They're only going to get an AP chest versus an AP and lateral or better yet versus a PA, which is better for magnification. So not only are they missing, you know, 50 percent of the information by only doing one view versus two. Uh, the one view that we do is fraught with issues, like it's an AP instead of a PA. The, as you know from our lab quiz, alignment can easily be off. Uh, we're not sure of what our SID is going to be. So all sorts of issues that in a diagnostic room are standardized, where you can lock in at 72 and automatically you know, align yourself to the, to the bucky. Right? So portables are just not great, um, but... Uh, they're necessary when they're necessary, right? If, if someone just has surgery and they're recovering in the recovery room, it's, you know, probably worthwhile to go do the portable there, right? Um, so there's definitely good reasons for doing portables, but I think there are a lot of orders that are unnecessary. Um, so, you know, another situation is if a person is in isolation, uh, are you going to bring that person out of that nice, you know, air current controlled room uh, and have them all over the hospital? Right. Um, so it does make our jobs more efficient if we didn't have a portable, then we would have to drag them down. Right. So most hospitals have a portable machine uh, or or many of them. So what makes them a little bit different uh, is that they're battery powered. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, they're known as capacitor. Uh, some of them are capacitor discharge units. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as well. And maybe we'll get to a little bit of C arm. So let's kind of just keep going here a little bit. Um, so this particular portable, I used something much worse than this. Um, this is considered a mobile unit because it's got an x-ray tube, but you, where is everything? You know, what we're used to looking at is this big boxy unit. And the reason we don't see it here is because there's no battery in this portable machine, which means it can be a lot lighter um, and it's less bulky. However, every time you want to use it, you have to plug it in during the procedure. So this is known as a capacitor discharge unit because what it'll do is you'll plug it in, the capacitor, think of it kind of as a bucket, will fill up with charge, get to a certain point, have enough charge to make the exposure, you set your, your technical factors, make your exposure, and then unplug. And then if you have to go to the next person, you do it again. The capacitor in most of the units I've worked with only allow one exposure uh, per plug-in or one plug-in per exposure, however you want to say it. 
Um, these, though, uh, even smaller ones, will fit in the back of a car, in the, in the back of a trunk. So for real mobile radiography, so there are companies, I worked for one once, who's the worst job I ever had. Um, you would go to various nursing homes and do some portables, and I may have described this to you before, but uh, especially with film, they're CR now, but when I was working with film, I had a briefcase, it was split in half with a piece of paper in the middle, and one side were films that I took that were exposed, and the other side were films that were unused yet, because you only had so many cassettes for the entire day. So occasionally you had to find, literally, a linen closet, a bathroom, you'd throw your jacket off, close the lights in the bathroom, throw it on the floor against the, the door to keep the light from getting in, change your film so that now your cassettes are fresh again, and repeat. It was, it was pretty horrible. I didn't have a route either. So um, I just went from the Bronx to Far Rockaway to, to wherever. Um, now, uh, it, those jobs pay more, right? Because no one wants them really. Um, except it was worse for me. There was like a slump in the market. So I wasn't even getting paid more. I was just getting paid at least. But um, so it's a challenging position, especially for those portable jobs. Uh, now I think they send you out in teams of two uh, and you might have a van instead of like a little geo storm like I had. And you might also have a partner. I was alone and you might have GPS. I had none. I had spiral maps in books. So it was, it was a lot more difficult. Uh, I had an alphanumeric pager too, which is anyone remember those? Like if someone wanted to give you like a, basically a text message now, right? They'd call up operator would say, what do you want to say? And you'd say, uh, go take your lunch break at three. And they type that in. And then you would get that page with the, with the text on it. It's basically life before text messaging which I guess was better than smoke signals, but it was like not, not much better. So, um, but the, the portable I used itself came apart. I'd have to put it kind of together uh, and it fit in the back of a very small car in the trunk. Um, these jobs are, are getting better, by the way. You know, like I said, there's teams, they're using CR, you have GPS, you have cell phones, you know, things. Things have gotten a little bit better, for sure. <clears throat> so what do you do when you have a patient uh, and you have a portable? Well, one is not even here. First thing you should do is make sure you have a correct patient, right? So you have to check their armband and if they don't have it, and we're usually the ones to, to sometimes point this out. We get there, there's no armband. You have to go to the nursing desk and, and say, well, you know, this person needs a band. Um, so you establish who they are. You want to try to establish a rapport uh, if you can, um, which is really tough when you're waking people up. You know, they're not going to be very happy and they do portables 24 hours a day. And, you know, um, the, the night evening crew, you know, they'll do a portable at 2.30, 3.30 in the morning. And, you know, you just kind of have to wake the patient up. When I worked during the day, that wasn't as bad because more people were, awake but uh, so get the patient's permission to do the exam uh, you don't have to fill out anything and they don't either you just kind of say we're here to do a portable and if they say no you turn around anyway um, but it's nice to kind of somewhat get their permission without walking in and saying may I have your permission to do this you know I wouldn't put it to them that way I, I would just say an x-ray has been ordered and that's what I'm here to do you know, if they want to say no, that's that's up to them. But if you give them the option, like, you know, would you like this X-ray? That's not that's not really the way to walk in. Uh, so you would explain the procedure, which is always helpful, and uh, get stuff out of the way, right? Uh, really, before you bring the the tube and the uh, mobile unit in the room, you should really scout inside the room, like which way am I going to approach the bed? You know, I'm going to be on the left side of the bed. Am I going to be on the right side of the bed? Uh, are, is there furniture that's going to get in the way? Is there anyone else in the room that might get in the way? Um, not that we remove other people from the room. Uh, guests, for sure. But patients, we don't have other patients step out. Um, 
So if they're incognizant, in other words, they can't understand what you're doing, uh, I would still speak with them and kind of go through the motions. Maybe they hear you, maybe they don't, uh, but I think it's the right thing to do. And as mentioned, we're doing these not just in patient rooms, but we're doing portables in the OR. Uh, we're doing portables uh, certainly in the emergency room, as you've seen a, a lot. Um, but when you go on portable rotation, um, you might not see because you might not be early enough. Usually rounds are sometimes done at you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then you're up there with a portable machine doing like 10, 15, 20 people in a row. Uh, usually helps when you have a partner uh, to do that. Okay. Um, so anyone go on portables? Everyone? I'm not saying we you comp it or not, but maybe just check it out. Um, it's more challenging, right? There's people to deal with. Um, unlike our portable quiz, which isn't quite fair, uh, what would be more fair but harder for you in, in actuality is if you had a patient and you hadn't x-rayed them, you know, 10 times in open lab and know exactly what you can do with the size cassette you have, right? When you have the unknown, it's much more easier to, to cut a cost of phrenic angle uh, or an apice. Uh, and to complicate matters, if it's a legit portable, especially if it's in the emergency room, uh, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of action going on, things are happening, um, they're compromised. Everything has to stop when you take your x-ray too. So you're working around people until you actually say x-ray and then everyone has to run out, right? Uh, and uh, unlike making a mistake, but of course we never make mistakes and have to repeat an exam, if you repeat in a, a portable, everyone knows that you're repeating it, right? Um, it's not the same as walking in uh, and telling the patient in the room, we, we need to do another another view, which is what I would say versus we're going to repeat the one we just did because it didn't come out right. <laughs> uh, we just need to do another view, right? Um, which is true. Uh, so uh, you're dealing with uh, a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, they may need to stop intubating the patient, you know, while you take your x-ray because they actually stop, run out, uh, and then you take your x-ray. One of the things that you need to be aware of is making sure that you prep everything, right? Um, don't yell x-ray and then position. You know, get, get the plate under the patient, uh, have your technique all set basically ready to expose, then you say x-ray, right? Uh, and if you're doing a chest x-ray, uh, probably pretty easy. If you're doing cross-table uh, C-spine, which they are doing less and less because a lot of people are going to CAT scan, um, that's hard because it's hard to get C7, right? When you're going through the shoulders going crosswise. So a lot of times you'll need someone to hold the patient. You can't take the exposure and hold them at the same time either. Uh, and we're not really allowed to do that. So it's not like I hold and my, my other fellow tech uh, makes the exposure. That's not really supposed to happen either. The physician's supposed to pull shoulders down, right? You're not supposed to be pulling. Um, anyone see cross table, lateral C-spine? Anything other than a chest? Portable fill in the blank, like pelvis, abdomen. Okay. What's that? Knee and foot. Portable? Yeah. Why was it portable? They couldn't come oh, to the department? Right oh, right out of the OR. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So definitely lots of challenges. If you have a horse, that's a challenge. Um, what I wanted to point out really with this picture is look how small the unit is. That's it. Now, I don't like that because what's the radiation protection to his like forehead? It's like right there, so, so much for six feet. I, I don't know how much, you know, that would be. Um, it, that's what it looks like, and it looks like she's holding the image receptor here. So I don't know if they're getting a mandible or, or what, they're, what they're doing. You know, um, the basics, as you've seen in the lab here, and is still the same. You still have KB. Uh, you don't have 
much power over the time of the exam, right? So you just set the mass, which incorporates time, but you can't actually change it, right? You can't change your MA or your time. You can only change mass. You hope that it has a fast time, right? That whatever mass you're using is a combination of higher MA and lower time because motion can be an issue on any exam, but you know, um, repeating a portable, even if it's like a legit repeat, is still tougher than repeating an exam that's already in the room, right? You know, imagine you have to go back to the department with your portable, take the cassette, process it, and then find out you have to go back upstairs. So one thing that's nice about the uh, mobile units that have a screen and their DR, you instantly see it. So if you did make a mistake or something happened, uh, then at least it's not like you got on an elevator, went all the way back to the department, and then have to trek all the way back. <coughs> uh, grids are a serious issue, which is why we don't use grids on the chest x-rays. Uh, you ever see anyone use a grid on the chest x-ray? Yeah. Yeah. Portable chest. Yeah. yeah, it's tough. You can do it, but it's tough because you can get grid cutoff very easily because anytime you're not directly centered to the grid and all of a sudden your diverging beams are being directed into one of the little lead lines, um, you're going to get a loss of uh, radiation because it's going to kill those photons before it actually hits the plate. Now, some of the flat panel detectors might have grids built into them. Uh, that's nice. That's an improvement. Uh, some of these units are, are getting better and better. Whereas um, I think I saw an urgent care that claimed they had x-ray, but what they really had was like a portable machine in a room. <laughs> but I guess it was kind of working for them. Um, but that's not really the same in, in my mind. Uh, so grids are very difficult to use with portables because you have problems of alignment, but also if you're out of focal spot distance, um, then you can also have the same kind of problem. Some of the grids that we use, most of the grids that we use are known as focus grids, meaning they have to be used within a certain SID. And other factors like gowning up and gloving up and all sorts of things that we have to do when we do portables. Uh, it's just hard. I just like this picture because I don't know what they're doing here. I think there's some kind of radiation therapy or something. Because so there's, there's no SID at all. Here, they have this unit right up against the patient. So again, um, you only have limited MA and KD, right? You don't have the really good generators that, that we have. Although most of the formal machines can pretty much do what you need them to do. Uh, again, SID, you're not sure what the SID is. I mean, they do have that, you know, very high tech measuring tape coming off of the portable machine. I haven't seen a portable machine that doesn't have one, but uh, it's not so easy. So general rule, uh, we should increase the MA uh, one step. What that means is one press of the button, right? One step uh, for every 10 inches of SID after the technique that you may have already established. So in other words, if you know what works with 40 uh, inches uh, and you have a particular MAS for that, you go up one step if you find yourself now at 50. Two steps if you find yourself at 60 inches. So um, the mobile equipment, of course, is designed to be mobile and move around. Uh, but they're big and they're bulky and they don't go down steps. Um, always be careful getting into an elevator with a portable machine. They don't, the elevators don't always line up perfectly when they hit the floor. I mean, if you're a person, you just kind of step on over. But if you have this, I don't know how heavy the portable machine is. It's heavy, though, right? So I wouldn't push it over the bump of an elevator. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, but going around corners, you have to be careful. I don't know if you've seen the mirrors that they have set up in, in a lot of hospitals. You probably don't really think about it unless you're in our field and then realize what they're for. Uh, I suppose they're for maybe stretchers that are going around corners as well. So the transporters probably know. Um, but 
they're, they're hard to position, right? I have found areas that were so tight that I had to, uh, just as I was entering the room, I had to actually move the tube and get it out and then wheel the tube into place before I even got the entire unit where I wanted it. Um, so it's difficult. You can't dim the light as easily either. If you want to see what's going on, it's bright sun coming through the window and you can't see your collimator very well, right? I mean, you can try to close the blinds, but you know, this, you name it, there's something to always think about when you're doing a portable. Um, that they, that's why they become very challenging. Uh, generator uh, and the base unit can be either high or, or, or low frequency. Most of them are higher frequencies. Um, the locks have gotten easier. When I did the demo for you, uh, we talked about friction locks. Uh, friction locks don't really exist anymore. Those, you, you would put the tube in a certain place and then kind of actually kind of screw it in and it used friction to keep it in place. Now they're electromagnetic, you just let go and it stops, which is great. I mean, every year things get even easier. Um, so the electromechanical locks, you know, uh, are great because you don't have to constantly sort of unscrew and rescrew something in. Right. Uh, the only friction lock I think that's left on the portable is the, the little screw to turn to move the collimator box is, is still technically a friction lock. Right. But um, the older portables, at least the older uh, GE portables, actually didn't swing in both directions. So you had to figure out which way you were going into the room, where they were going to be. And then sometimes you'd have to spin your tube outside of the room so that when you got into the room, it would kind of turn in the correct direction. Yeah, now it just goes whichever way you want it to go. You would think it always did that, but believe it or not, no. There's always improvements to be made, and you don't even realize them until they, they happen. Here's something that happened, but then they went back to the old way. They used to have remote control Exposure switches. I may have told you about this before, right? You could have all sorts of fun with them. No cord. You wouldn't have Jody Ann and I yell at you like, you know, snap our cord when you're like, you know, too far back because it would be, you know, there'd be no cord. Uh, of course, what would happen is they'd lose the exposure switch. You know, that's like having your TV and not be able to change the channel. Right. Worse, at least you could watch one channel usually. <clears throat> so they tried that. I mean, it was kind of cool. You could, you know, make some, some moves when you were doing your exam. Uh, chest radiography, right? Um, 40 is usually not far enough, right? We wouldn't do 40 uh, unless we had to, which is why the rule, as we've discussed, is we use as much SID as we can. The only exams that should be done at 40 inches are the exams that are mandated to be done at 40. So a KUB is still done at 40. Extremity work is still done at 40. Spine work, I guess, would still be done at 40. But a chest x-ray should be done PA standing with 72 inches. Now, if it's a portable, you can't do any of those things. Right? You're doing an AP at much less than 40, and of course, they're not standing. Right. Um, and it gets more complicated too, because sometimes they're not in the bed either. Sometimes they're sitting in a chair, in which case I'll do the x-ray in the chair rather than like put them back into the bed. Um, so let's just, just have a look at how that works. Those are usually pretty good for the most part. Anyone uh, do a portable that needed to be repeated? Like, we've got to go do this again. Why? Cut something. What else? Anything else? Well, it's usually not technique anymore. That was another issue um, on that machine that I used to go to nursing homes and whatnot with. Um, not only did you have all the other issues, but then you didn't know whether you were going to get too dark or too light of an exposure. By the way, stat, man, like, 
to be done within like three hours. <laughs> it took on a different rationale. Um, so yeah, I mean, distance for sure with portables is your friend. I mean, you want to use more than 40 because maybe you'll capture that cost of frantic angle, right? Things get much tougher uh, at 40 inches than 60, let's say. There's only so much distance you can get in the supine, right? You just can't reach the thing. You know, if it's a stretcher, you can put the stretcher down as far as it goes, two up as far as it goes. Uh, even bed, regular beds go up and down also, but they're a little bit more complicated. And then you have to be careful because if they're hooked up to all sorts of machines and lines and things, you don't want to like move the bed around too much and then, you know, pull something out. Has anything ever come out yet in front of you? Like, oops, pulled the line out. Did I tell you the story where like I felt the wetness in the groin area? Yeah, it's like, you know, patients here, you know, leaning over doing stuff and like all of a sudden I feel this wet spot over here it's like blood all over you know and like an a an arterial line to get out. happens that's why we don't wear suits at work right uh but i had to get tested and everything looks like he can sit up to me when possible sit them up because chances are if you sit them up you'll be able to get longer SID, but in addition, based on coconut, you'll get better fluid levels also, right? So it's good all around if they can sit up. Uh, and as we know, breathing instructions should be given. And I did notice during our portable exam, I didn't make that much of a big deal out of it, um, but a lot of people just went through the motions a little too fast. But then again, I was pushing people because we were running out of time. So as long as you said, take in a, I was like happy for the most part. Right. But technically, you have to give people time to take in a deep breath. And sometimes you have to sometimes they do it wrong or incorrectly or they don't understand you because one, they're sick or there's a language barrier or both. Or you never know what it is. Um, but uh, if they can take a, a better breath in, it's it's helpful. But again, it also depends what they're looking for. Right. If they're looking for a line placement, who cares whether their lungs are aerated or not? But then again, you shouldn't go by that either. Right. So you should always have them take a deep breath in because it's nice to have a good chest x-ray to see more than just the one thing that they happen to be looking for. Right. They get an assessment overall. So just because you see line placement doesn't mean you can't do everything else as well. So technically, A would be the should be the best image, but no one ever does A. I've never done A. I've never seen anyone put a pillow behind anyone's back. All right, maybe I've seen it once or twice or maybe done it once or twice. But it's not really routine, right? Uh, most of the time you get a lordotic image um, just from trying too hard to get it right. Um, B is more often what's done. It, but these angles, 26, 64, meaningless. We don't have angles. We don't know. Rule of thumb, angle down more than you think you need to. Um, always look at your image when it comes out. If the ribs, if it's better yet, if the clavicles are, are above the apices and straightened out instead of a V, that's a repeat in most people's books. Even though you didn't cut anything, that, that's a repeat. I saw a lot of that here, but I think some of it has to do with the phantom, so I didn't pay too much attention to it. Are there any teams that like tell you like No, but you should create that. <laughs> because what that, that would mean though, it would mean is your cassette had to be talking to your machine. Right, so it wouldn't just be, you know, or either that or some series of lasers. I don't know what. Um, so, yeah, everything's just kind of eyeballing it, uh, pretty much. <clears throat> but this is what we do if it's a regular chest x ray, right? You know, we get the patient as straight as, as, straight as we can. We never, you know, have them do this. 
unless they order a lordotic image, which is rare. Anyone ever see them order a lordotic image? If it would be clavicle. Oh, for the clavicle? Yeah. Oh, well, that kind of makes sense. Except um, usually even with the clavicle, you won't have the patient do that. You'll just angle up and sit. Uh, but it would achieve the same thing, essentially. Coconuts, right? Unfortunately, A coconut is what we get most of the time, which is no fluid levels. B coconut would be perfect, except we said these come out lordotic and they don't actually work. So even though this is the best image, we don't do it. Um, None of these look really good. Um, I guess this would be kind of the best one. This creates too much OID and might work with the coconut, but wouldn't work with real people, really. Uh, well, this is the best one, but not achievable. So most likely what we get is this, because we're doing it supine, or you know, something in between these two. Because none of these images match up, you know, what none of C and D here don't match up with B. So uh, the unit I had was, I think, worse than this. Um, and didn't, I guess it had, it was like a tripod with an x ray tube. Um, and I didn't get parking. I would like move this thing, like, you know, I'd have to like walk two blocks in the snow and stuff, and get it there. I think I worked there maybe two months, three months before I was like, no. And started looking for traffic jams. Uh, so the portable machine should obviously have pretty long cords. Uh, especially if it's a capacitor discharge and you have to plug it in. Uh, but you know, wherever you're going, you didn't always have, you know, this thing built with uh, the fact that someone might come into a portable x-ray. I mean, before these companies existed, patients went to the hospital and got their x-rays there. Something needed to happen. Um, so sometimes you uh, didn't have enough cord. Or if you did, you still had to work with it, it wasn't really optimal. But you would plug them uh, into whatever outlet you had available there. Uh, and they worked. I mean, you got an x-ray. Um, you know how you knew that you need to repeat the image? Well, it was tough. You had to wait till the end of the day. When you go back to like the home office and process. Every once in a while you process in a hospital, um, but that would be based on um, if they call the stat or something to that effect, you'd have to take your x-ray to maybe a hospital that had an affiliation with the company. Yeah, it was just kind of a nightmare. Uh, and they'd order everything, like skull x-rays, not just chest x-rays. Um, I guess I'm glad I had the experience. Um, but not an experience I want to have again. Um, but you got to look into the companies now, right? I think they have, you know, team teamwork and CR cassettes and all sorts of good stuff going on. Uh, so here's our distinct definition of capacitor uh, discharge that we already talked about. Uh, it's not going to work if you don't plug it in. Our machines are the opposite, right? The typical battery powered machines. You can't get an exposure when it's plugged in. And we deal with these nice, big, chunky batteries. I don't know how many are in there. I, I don't think I've seen the inside. Uh, I don't know if it's one or more of these. These kind of look uh, like the size of a motorcycle battery versus a, a car battery. Uh, but I can't even tell you how many there are. Um, Don't run over your foot with the portable machine, though. So these are nice. Again, you know, if you have a console, especially if it's hooked up to your radiology information system and you don't have to 
put any information in. Um, pretty good. Uh, for a minute, I thought this said GPS. I'm like, oh, that's new. <laughs> like instructing how to get to the patient's room. Um, maybe one day things will be so inexpensive that people will be sitting on giant flat panel detectors in, embedded into every room. Who knows? Right? Or they'll come up with something that uh, where you don't use x-rays. And there are, they're, they're getting there. Who knows? Um, some other type of particle. Oh, don't worry. Your jobs are okay um, for a while. Um, uh, constant potential generators are what we're utilizing in the hospital. What that means is the KV doesn't fluctuate. Right? When you have alternating current, which is what you get from a plug, uh, you have dips where the KV goes up and dips where the KV goes down. Uh, in our rooms here, we have AC current, but it gets converted to DC. So the potential stays the same, and you get a more streamlined feed, which ends up being better for energy. Now, if the portables can kind of reproduce that, and, and some of them can, then it's not as much of an issue. Um, but some of the portables out there are probably not utilizing constant potential generators. Uh, 110 or 220. Um, yeah, once the capacitor is charged, it can be discharged through an x-ray. I don't remember a case where I kind of plugged it in and then didn't take the x-ray, just unplugged it and went home or left. Maybe when I quit that day. Um, but yeah, I remember having to plug it in each time I did an image. Right, it, it wasn't like you could charge it up, kind of, because there was no, there was nothing to charge it. Uh, let's see. So, this one up here is a, essentially what you want. You want KV that kind of stays constant versus something that dips up and down. Now, the unit that I used at, at nursing homes that fit in the car and all that uh, was not power assisted, it was me, right? I was the generator. I had to push and pull and, and do what have you. Uh, I mean, it didn't have all the batteries, but you still had to move the thing around. Um, it didn't have any dead man switch, right? If you hit something, you made a dent. Uh, which you can still do with these, right? You have to be careful. Um, uh, many, many a time I felt like opening the door to some stairwell and just kind of dropping it down there. But uh, that's, that's one way to get fired, I suppose. Um, there were a lot of things I liked about doing portables. They're challenging. They get you out of the apartment a little bit. You know, you're on your on your own. You don't have a supervisor right on top of you sometimes. And, you know, some of the people that do portables, um, that's all they do, and they're happy. You know, um, I guess it depends on, you know, your state. Uh, state of mind, state of what you like to do. Um, it all depends. Uh, they, they do get dirty and they do need to be wiped down from time to time that I don't think people are taking the time to, to do that. Um, I know we did when we would use these at the burn units. Who, has anyone been in the burn unit like Cornell? Have you been there? 
I asked to go. There was no SUV. Excuse me? I asked to go, but I didn't go any extra. There was no SUV. Oh, okay. You just wanted to. <laughs> just wanted to smell cauterized flesh? <laughs> um, yeah, burning it's a tough place, right? Making the portable experience even more complex. Um, you have to be somewhat sterile in the OR. It's not like an OR. Uh, you have you have to you have to gown up a little bit, um, and you have to cover your cassettes for sure, right? Does that mean time up? Time's up. <laughs> oh, right. I heard some. I heard some buzzing. Um, so limitations, not as much power. Um, life is more difficult if you have a 300 pound patient and you have to do a portal. Um, lack of table and SID control. So yeah, I mean, you don't have a table. So how do you move the patient into position? You have to pull them into position. It's hard. Um, how, a few of you said you've done or at least seen a KUB portable abdomen. Easy? No. no. So you use the grid for that that exam. You use a grid for for two reasons: a thick part, um, but also there's less angling on the tube, so you don't have to worry as much about grid cutoff and those kind of things. But they're hard. I mean, how do you make sure? How do you know the patient's in the middle? You you stab your patient right through the middle, <laughs> then you take out your cassette, see if it's in the middle, and then try to do it again. Get it back in the right place. No, you, what do you do? You just kind of feel on one side and feel on the other side. It's like putting on a tablecloth, right? It's like, all right, I need a little bit more here. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not that easy to, to do, right? And anyone do the cubes? Those are bars. Anyone do chest the cubes? Well, that's like the most horrible. Because they're they're really challenging, and you have to make sure that you get the, the bottom side to be elevated a little bit, which is really really tough. They do check and cook problems pediatric. Oh, pediatrics are are much easier. Yeah, because you can put a baby on a sponge, and the sponge stays in place. Right. Um, you get a 150, 200 pound person and it's much more difficult. Yeah. All I have to lift up here is my mouse, my pen. Life is easier. Um, let's see, do we have one or two more things here? No, I think that's it. All right, so um, we are finished. I think next week, I have you guys for lab next week? No. No. This is the very last lab, right? Monday, 